Ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear students, um, that's really my very special pleasure to be here again um, in first time in this new building. And um, I'm very, very pleased to talk to young people. Uh, would you like to show how many of you are from Europe? Would you like to raise your hands? Oh, you're mostly from Europe. All of you. Some not. <laughs> Where are you from? Canada. So, and you are from? Italy. I don't see you quite well. I see you have a <laughs> very, very dark here. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, yeah. Uh, Russia and the new security situation in, in Europe. Um, Mark asked me to make a very short introduction, about 15-20 uh, minutes. It's very difficult to be in this uh, time frame speaking about Russia. Uh, about a country with a uh, long history, with a long traditions and um, with uh, great ambitions as we have seen in, in recent uh, few years. I would say just a few words, perhaps, uh, for the background a little bit, uh, what concerns uh, the Putin's uh, regime, uh, the Kremlin uh, uh, power. Uh, if we go back um, uh, to the history by 2000, year 2000, then you can recall how old you were in the year of 2000. It was the year when uh, Putin uh, came to power. In Russia, it was quite ridiculous. In 1999, Mr. Yeltsin, President uh, Boris Yeltsin, he just announced on the New Year's Eve that uh, he's tired, he does not want to be a president anymore, and he gave power to Mr. Putin. A temporary power, it lasted a few months, then they had official uh, presidential elections, and Mr. Putin uh, came uh, to power in, in March uh, 2000. And uh, the first period of his administration, uh, from uh, 2000 till 2004, it was quite uh, peaceful. It was uh, promising, a young person uh, still taking over from an uh, old man who started the democratic reforms in Russia. And everybody had uh, high expectations in Europe and in NATO that Russia will be a continue, continuing a strategic partner uh, a true economic partner and a political partner to build up a mutually useful uh, relationships. NATO opened up its doors. Uh, Russia uh, was taken as a partner to the NATO as well. Uh, NATO-Russia Council was established in, in 2001. And um, also the good uh, relationship with the European Union was introduced uh, and a lot of uh, joint uh, economic projects, uh, the value-based uh, projects, were launched. At the same time, in parallel, um, European Union and NATO enlarged and uh, something has started to change in Russia as well, especially after the uh, next presidential elections in 2004, when Putin became a president second time. And then we already had uh, NATO enlarged and European Union enlarged. And then we have uh, started to feel uh, inside the European Union that something uh, is uh, not always going the way what uh, was expected um, from the partners, started from the human rights violations, uh, limitations, uh, uh, of personal freedoms in Russia, and uh, step by step, uh, things uh, started to, to go down. And then suddenly, uh, out of the blue, we faced in 2008, it was uh, the last year of the second term of Mr. Putin, we, we faced the fact that um, there was a military conflict between Georgia and uh, Russia. And uh, when we look back why this conflict merged, then um, there, is, um, uh, there is the fact, uh, the historical fact, but we cannot really hide. Uh, then the fact was, and the fact is that uh, in 2008, in December, uh, Georgia and both Ukraine 
had to be invited to become a member of NATO in Bucharest summit. And in order to avoid this uh, NATO enlargement process continuing, uh, the military conflict uh, was launched and uh, none of them, non, not uh, Georgia, non Ukraine became a member of NATO till now. And then the conflict um, calmed down and uh, Europe, NATO, uh, in a way they forgot that so far till nowadays, Abkhazia and South Ossetia are still occupied by Russian Federation and um, the frozen conflict is lasting, going on there. Uh, nobody in Europe did not make a serious uh, uh, consequences or serious uh, analysis uh, what can happen next. Until uh, last year, until uh, September last year, when the Ukrainian government and the parliament made a decision that Ukraine will uh, sign uh, the association agreement with the European Union. The association agreement, uh, which is mostly um, concentrating on the economic uh, uh, and cultural uh, and people-to-people -people, um, uh, cooperation. And uh, since September last year, uh, things uh, started to go worse very fast. Uh, we uh, immediately um, show the uh, different uh, protests, the division of Ukrainian people between West and, and East, uh, which uh, was uh, the consequence uh, of the government and parliamentary decision to make the final and historical step uh, to cooperate and to integrate with Europe. Instead, uh, integrating uh, with the Eurasian Union what is pushed by so far by Kremlin and, and uh, which is a very, very uh, prioritized agenda of Mr. Putin uh, since 2012. Ukraine is a big country and an important country. It's, uh, it has a size um, almost like Germany. It has a lot of resources, a lot of human resources, natural resources, uh, despite its poor country so far, but it has a, a, enormous resources. And uh, for Kremlin, it's, uh, it's clear that uh, without Ukraine, uh, Eurasian Union would have been a sort of paper tiger without real power, without access to the direct border uh, to, to Europe, etc. And also historically, culturally, we can see not only the economic or political or geopolitical interests, but, um, but uh, very, very much uh, uh, Putin, uh, Putin's political elite is, is uh, arguing that uh, Ukrainians are naturally Slavic people. They historically belong together. Ukraine and, and Russia has been uh, once upon in the history like uh, one state. Actually, the Russian state started from Kiev, old Kiev. And there are a lot of emotions uh, on, on the one hand, a lot of history on the second point, and on the third point, of course, uh, there is a clear geopolitical uh, interest and, and power games uh, uh, concerning the balance of powers um, uh, between West and, and East, or West and Russia directly saying. And uh, because of this, um, uh, reasons we unfortunately we are today all of uh, us are facing uh, a very very serious security uh, situation in Europe it's not only in Ukraine it's it's not only the Baltic countries which are very uh, often referred if we see what has happened now within last one month in the Baltic Sea region especially against the countries like Sweden and Finland who are not members of NATO like the, the other three Baltic states, uh, Latvia, Estonia, and, and Lithuania are. Now, um, next step, what I feel um, from my personal um, observation is that uh, now Kremlin is trying to um, make some sort of um, experiments on the non-NATO countries uh, in, the, in the north, near the, nor near the, near, near the Baltic Sea, and to, to see how the West is reacting. What can the uh, European Union do? What can uh, uh, NATO do if the Russian submarine is uh, just uh, uh, 
uh, spending its time about uh, two weeks uh, in the Swedish waters near Stockholm. Uh, they, uh, in Kremlin, observe what Finland can do if the Russian military planes are flying uh, almost every day above the Baltic Sea. And uh, even, um, even very, very, I must say, uh, diplomatically, very like uh, uh, with a sort of um, uh, uh, exposing their powers, uh, I think the fact that on the 6th of uh, December, uh, about a week ago, when Finland had uh, its national holiday, the whole day, the Russian military planes were flying um, nearby the um, uh, Finnish border on the, on the Baltic Sea, and President Putin did not send a um, telegram of congratulating uh, Finnish people and, and, and Finnish colleagues, as usually uh, is done by, by the heads of state on, on the occasion of the national day of the country, especially neighboring countries, because Finland and, and Russia, as you know, are also uh, neighboring countries. Uh, and also, the, the, the last two or three days incidents in, in Swedish uh, airspace and, and the Finnish airspace when uh, the uh, Russian military planes without transponders or any um, uh, electronic equipment switched on are flying in, in our airspace, not, not in Estonian airspace, but uh, in the Baltic Sea airspace and threatening uh, the uh, civil planes. There was almost a very serious incident. Uh, just a couple of days ago uh, between uh, Denmark and, and, uh, and Sweden in the Swedish shared space uh, when there was almost a crash. And, uh, and uh, now the question is, what can be done? Who can do what? Because NATO is not able to protect uh, and uh, to just kick away the, the Russian military planes if they come to the, to the airspace of Sweden or, or Finland, like they normally do if the Russian airplanes are coming into the Estonian, Latvian, Polish uh, or some other um, neighboring uh, airspaces. What can be done to preserve peace because nobody wants war? Uh, and, um, and nobody has really good answers. The diplomatic um, relations with Russia are very, very, very hot in the moment. Uh, as you know, yesterday Mr. Lavrov and Mr. Kerry met in Italy without any results uh, finding a common language on Ukraine. Um, this week there will be another EU summit when the EU leaders are gathering and, and trying to find, find out sort of way uh, how to uh, take uh, Russia back on the ground and, 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 and uh, stopping, uh, stopping really this um, uh, military uh, battles in, in, in Ukraine. And the problem is in this that um, and which is a very unique problem, I think, also in, in the history, that you, you even cannot officially talk to Russia about this military conflict in Ukraine because Russia denies being in Ukraine. Uh, as you all know, that uh, they, they, they say that these green men are not uh, Russian militaries, they are just volunte volunteers or just some people fighting there. Uh, but all the NATO intelligence, uh, the big uh, EU uh, countries' uh, intelligence, they all see and know that these are the Russian militaries. They are, this is not only personnel, but also the equipment. And the point is that how can you talk to, to Russian uh, leaders if they deny that, uh, that this is not their problem, as Putin has said several times. So the situation is ridiculous and, and, and uh, most serious. So. Uh, I'm almost 50 years old. I, I don't remember this kind of things uh, even from the Cold War time when I was uh, young like you or, or when I was a child. But now we are facing um, uh, the real threat uh, in, in Europe and, and uh, the threat is not only because of the Ukrainian uh, situation there, but the, the threat is uh, in the fact that we don't know what Putin plans. Who is next? If we cannot stop Putin in, in Ukraine, if he, he's allowed uh, well, to play this dirty game that he doesn't know anything about Ukraine. If the sanctions, what US and European Union has posed, have posed, 
if they don't uh, change uh, Russia, then uh, what, what can be done? Maybe, and this will be my last point before we start discussion, maybe the, um, the economic situation itself will help us a little bit because, um, as you know, Russian economy is heavily depending on gas and oil incomes. You all know that uh, the price on, on, on oil has, uh, uh, has uh, fallen uh, uh, more than two times. Uh, over the last years, it's now about $60 uh, per barrel. It used to be 130 like five, six years ago. And this really makes sense. And uh, if you look um, on the, the budget 2015, what Russia is now preparing, then uh, already the officially uh, the uh, Russian Ministry of Finance uh, have announced that they must now open the reserves, what they have, uh, the state reserves, what they have 90 billion US dollars. They have to take out from this 90 about 12.5 uh, billions in order to cover the elementary needs uh, for the state budget next year. Uh, this is uh, quite a serious uh, movement and, and also the sanctions, um, uh, what, how they influence the situation. It's not only about personal sanctions on visas, but economic sanctions and also sanctions on technologies. For example, the Russian economy, once again, it needs all the time uh, the innovation. But the innovation can be based on, on the modern technology, what they normally imported uh, from uh, Europe or from US. Now they cannot do it, and, and uh, replacing uh, the technologies uh, with, uh, I don't know, Chinese, uh, some other Asian uh, technologies, or to develop uh, their own technologies, it simply take time. It will take time. And therefore, the situation again reminds me, this economic side of this conflict uh, reminds me a little bit uh, the Cold War times when uh, during the Reagan's time at the end of, uh, or in the 80s of last century, when uh, why why Soviet Union collapsed? It was not only this was not the political reason why it collapsed, but it collapsed because of the economic reasons. Because the United States so much uh, pressed on on United, uh, Soviet Union through the different economic um, uh, measures, and and uh, especially in that time, the the the, the tool was the military um, equipment. Uh, what was developing so fast in the US that uh, Soviet Union was not able to, to follow these developments and they, 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 they didn't finally at the end of the day have enough money to invest into these uh, 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 space programs and whatever in that time the US developed. So uh, once again, uh, the situation is, 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 is not good, uh, but um, on the other hand, um, uh, I guess that the European Union is much stronger. It's really existing. It's not comparable with the 80s of last century. We are 28 countries together. Our political leaders are together and they, they, they want really to find sort of way that all the member states of the European Union, even if they are not members of NATO, that they are protected and, and finally uh, sort of... Uh, 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 modus vivendi, how to um, find the way out uh, from this situation with Russia uh, will be found. So that is a short introduction that was probably a little longer than 15 minutes, but um, I hope that you got some ground for debate, questions, or just arguments, contra-arguments, if you want. Or is it so cold that your <laughs> brains are frozen? <laughs> yes, you have a question. Oh, you, you've got the microphone also. Sorry. So being from Estonia, um, one of the Baltic states, so what do you think that the Baltic states, Finland, Poland, like sort of the former Soviet bloc can do now uh, to sort of de-escalate the problems and de-escalate the issues going on in the Ukraine and what might spread to other regions of the former Soviet Union? Well, the, the um, most uh, important um, uh, emotional uh, point, uh, what we have to do, of course, uh, is to, to, to work together, 
uh, what NATO has uh, stressed uh, many, many times, uh, the, also the new NATO Secretary General has been recently in Estonia. Uh, Mrs. Merkel was in Estonia, well, uh, well sorry, the, she was in, in Latvia, and, uh, Mr. Obama was in Estonia, just politically uh, saying very clearly that uh, we don't give up. We, we, we stand where we are, we keep our values, we, we don't move. Um, what uh, will probably happen next if uh, Putin is not um, going to stop uh, his activities in Ukraine, uh, we will probably get more um, US and NATO troops on our soil in Poland and in other Baltic states. Um, ten years ago, uh, when we signed the NATO uh, accession treaty, I signed it myself as a foreign minister, we never, never, ever could imagine that the American soldiers will be on Estonian ground. But this is the fact today. Since April this year, we have a couple of hundreds of, of Americans in, in the Baltics, in, in, in Poland. And um, I think that following your question, uh, if Putin will not stop, we will get them more. And then not only in, in, in the Baltics, uh, probably also these NATO troops which were withdrawn um, 10 years ago from the other parts of Europe they may return. And this is because of the balance of, of powers. You, you must balance, uh, just to give you the fact why it's important, just uh, like uh, from February this year, nearby the uh, Estonian and uh, other Baltic borders, there are uh, Russian Iskanders, the rocket carriers, which were not there, never ever, but since February they are there. And uh, they are just, um, well, like 100 kilometers from Estonian border. Uh, the same uh, applies to Germany, by the way, like um, uh, since um, autumn, I can't remember exactly, was it September, October, um, uh, Kremlin has taken uh, Iskanders also near to Kaliningrad, and they can shoot uh, almost till Berlin less than 70 kilometers from Berlin. So you see, if the, if, uh, if, uh, if the other side is putting its military equipment on such a heavy wage, then you simply may, must make a balance. Otherwise, you know, it will not work. Yes? Uh, hello, um, my name is Rolit. I was uh, Friday, this last Friday, on a conference about Ukraine. It was quite interesting about uh, there were people from Ukraine uh, who reported about the happenings in there. And um, there was a point I found really interesting that about the sanctions from mm -hmm. the USA uh, and uh, from Europe, that after the decision was taken, um, to make these sanctions against Russia. Uh, only Germany made uh, business with Russia for more than 3 billion euro. And um, I really believe that if the sanctions are strict, that Russia will not um, hold very long. But I don't believe anymore <laughs> what uh, politicians are talking and what um, when th these sanctions are already um, in the in public I think they should be uh, hold and I don't know uh, maybe you can uh, bring me some more information mm. about this well uh, yes uh, you are absolutely right that uh, the um, uh, the um, um, one of the most important measures what can be used in this stage are the sanctions. And um, even a couple of months ago, when uh, the first sanctions were introduced, there was quite a clash between the European countries. Still some countries don't support uh, openly the, the, the sanctions but more and more countries are now on board because in the beginning they were really like Baltic states, Poland, United Kingdom and Sweden. 
Um, but now, if you see, uh, uh, the other countries are coming on board, and I think it is very important turn that Mrs. Merkel has finally took a, t taken a very clear standpoint on, on this issue. Uh, and, uh, and I think that uh, she has a reason. It's, uh, it's serious, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's serious. And, and I'm very happy to be here with you because, it's, you see, I'm coming so close from the Russian board and, and I live there every day and, and I, I am very much concerned like uh, Estonian people and, and people uh, living nearby the border are concerned. But uh, mostly still, I think in this moment, yet uh, most of uh, ordinary Europeans even living in Germany, not speaking, living in France, in Italy, in Spain, they don't feel it, they don't understand it, how serious it can be. And uh, therefore, I think that exactly the, the, you know, this kind of lectures, uh, this kind of, or even this, uh, this um, uh, auditorium here, which is offering uh, like the public diplomacy, cultural diplomacy, people to people information, uh, that uh, just uh, Europeans must understand that the situation is changed. It's, it's not the same like it was a year ago. It, it, it's changed really. I mean that uh, for us, as I said, we even a year ago, we didn't imagine that we will have NATO troops in Estonia. We see every day, uh, I'm, I'm driving, I'm living uh, like 40 kilometers from Tallinn. Uh, my house is uh, in the countryside. I'm driving every day. I see every day the military cars, what I haven't seen, I don't know, 10 years maybe. They are driving every day on our ro roads now because the situation has changed. There is another one there, question. I would like to ask about the information war because mm. sanctions are important. They obviously help, but I think that they help Putin to uh, spread the knowledge about the Europe that there is, uh, that, that Europe is actually um, fighting Russia and also not the Russian government, but also the society. So society stands behind the Putin also because of he used sanctions in his information war. And I think this point is very missed because um, in Ukraine, a uh, revolution was about the people. And I think it should be a lot of done to, to support like opposition movement in Russia because maybe they can, yeah, maybe they can stop this, this whole thing because I think something is missed. Like, I don't know what, maybe you can comment on it. Mm. Well, the, um, uh, the NGOs, as you know, they are mostly switched off in, in Russia, the, the democratic NGOs. They are called uh, by law, the foreign agents. They are not allowed uh, to, to work. Many of them, the Western NGOs, they simply removed from, uh, they, they moved out from Russia. But I just uh, coming here today, I, I read um, that also the Moscow School of Civic Education and, and also Memorial and Andrei Saharov Center has been recently harassed. Uh, and and uh, they, um, they, um, if they, if they criticize Putin, then they face uh, sanctions themselves as a civil society organization. Last week, there was a very important annual conference in, in Moscow where I was not able to go, but um, uh, the most um, uh, famous human rights and opposition leaders uh, are gathering once a year with the support of, of uh, European Parliament. Uh, and uh, there was a serious discussion about the situation of the civil society. It's, it's much, much worse than in 2012, if you remember, when they had the big demonstrations on the streets. Now, uh, you know, this... Um, Young people who came to the peaceful demonstrations, they, many of them are still in jail. You, don't, you simply don't know. You know that these two, two girls of Pussy Riot, they, they were released because of the huge international pressure. But many young people are still uh, in trial or they are just uh, in, 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 the, in the prison. And people are simply afraid, and uh, this is one thing. And uh, you, you started saying exactly very uh, rightly that uh, there is a sort of uh, propaganda and, and brainwash. 
uh, been done already since, um, again, since 2004, when Putin started his second term in, in office, they changed from the ground all the history books in Russian schools. So uh, Stalin is a hero already last 10 years. Uh, all this new generation in Russia, they have educated in, 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 the, in, the, in terms that uh, um, Russia has a great power, the world power, the Stalin was a hero and etc. All history books are printed in one printing house in, in Russia, centrally controlled by Putin, and, and the, the owner of the print house is a good uh, Putin's friend, his Judo partner, in fact. So it's, it's uh, this um, brainwashing of young people, why these young people are supporting uh, Kremlin or Putin, uh, this is, uh, this is, um, this is, um, for Europeans, it's very, very difficult to understand because if you would sit, uh, if you would be in Moscow and sitting uh, together with your own age, young people, they mostly would say Putin is a great man, fantastic, doing right things. And of course, this uh, propaganda, which is uh, well, we will, we will. This is just the beginning, not the end. I mean that uh, the Sputnik channel, what was recently opened, this is not only uh, one TV or one radio channel. It's uh, multi-channel. It's multi-channel, and we will see. Basically, in Western European countries, mm -hmm. so the propaganda Putin does don't want to stop on Russian society, but also he wants to Western society to to actually be a part of it. So. I think it's very important to fight with, with this propaganda. We cannot be like open for dialogue and can let him to spread his, you know, his propaganda also in our countries. It's very, very dangerous because in Poland, where I come from, mm -hmm. also a lot of young people is actually saying that, but you have to listen to the Putin. He, in some point, he's right. And I start hesitate if it's also, working there in Poland, so. Yes, and this is uh, what, uh, what the analysts would call asymmetrical um, uh, measures. You cannot really take a contrameasure against uh, uh, this kind of uh, weapon, let's say, this um, multimedia weapon. And uh, they are very cleverly doing this already many, many years, of course, in Baltic countries, uh, what they do. And they do a country by country base. It's uh, even not um, universal. They will do different uh, messages for Spain, different messages for Germany. So, and, um, and I think this is also part of uh, NATO and, and the EU countries analysts to, to, to find out uh, the contrameasures. Uh, you see again, it's, uh, uh, it's very, um, I'm very sorry to, to recall this uh, Cold War times, but in that time, you know, we had a Radio Free Europe, we had American Voice uh, sort of, you know, uh, contra propaganda was working in Munich. There was a big headquarters of, of um, uh, Radio Free Europe uh, where the uh, Russian, uh, in that time, Soviet propaganda was turned down. Um, uh, so, uh, I think that still the most important priority for our leaders in Europe uh, is today to, to find the sort of solution on, on this situation, because if we don't find it uh, by one or another way, it goes even worse. I don't know what it can be exactly, but uh, uh, it's clear that um, it, uh, it, uh, it cannot end, uh, <laughs> end uh, uh, in, in, uh, in mutual trust or, or in useful cooperation if uh, things are continuing in that direction. Well, once again, maybe the economic situation in Russia, the sanctions will help, uh, or maybe the civil society opposition in Russia will find uh, themselves enough power, but um, looking at the opinion polls, then Putin is uh, still having about 70-80% of support among people. Yes. Um, yeah, we're talking a lot about Europe, but I don't think we're um, mentioning the role the United States is having in this conflict. So I would like to ask if, we, um, if within the European Parliament or the European Union, is, if they are like considering to 
um, deal with this conflict without the United States, since, since this conflict is within the European um, um, territory and so on. So. Well, I, I, yes, I got the point. Yes, I, I think the, this is exactly the way how things are going because the United States, they, they individually, they have their individual sanctions, they have their individual negotiations and meetings with, with Russian leaders, like, uh, as I said yesterday, Lavrov and uh, Kerry met in, in, in Italy. And uh, Europe uh, does uh, have their own agenda, but at the same time, of course, the consultations, they, they, they have to take place and they, they, are, they are taking place. Uh, like, um, actually, the United States started a little bit even earlier with the sanctions, uh, not only because of Ukraine, but you may remember uh, two years ago, the United States um, uh, adopted the, the so-called Magnitsky Act, where uh, several Russian I officials were sanctions, uh, sanctioned by visa uh, questions and, and uh, their um, financial... Um, uh, or their uh, property um, uh, were frozen in in, uh, in in United States of America, so there, there are some differences in uh, in in um, in, um, in politics between the U.S. and and Europe, but. Um, uh, at the same time, I think that uh, what we have experienced in the European Union uh, over this Putin's regime, when uh, Europe has tried to build up their relations with Russia, then always, always Putin has tried to separate the EU countries against each other, tried to pl play good friends with Germany, for example, uh, or with France, and then uh, being uh, not so good friends with Poland or, or for, with other some uh, countries like my own. And now I think that uh, we must be very careful also uh, looking on this, that uh, still with the United States, Europe is a strategic partner. And uh, this is a transatlantic partnership. What we have to do, by the way, in this context, we must really very, very fast uh, to conclude the negotiations of the free trade agreement between European Union and United States of America in order to strengthen our economic growth and, and, and our uh, economic perspectives in, in Europe. And of course, what, what, what again, what we must do together with the United States vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, uh, this Russian uh, pressure continuing is the energy safety and, and energy independence. Uh, mm -hmm. um, as less we, we buy from, uh, from uh, Russia, the gas and oil, then uh, stronger we are. So, no more questions. So, uh, well, uh, when, we, when we finish, uh, uh, there is the last one. Uh, Mark, you are there. I didn't even <laughs> see you there. I wanted to give the others the chance first, but uh, since there's no questions for now, one question I had for you as also an advisory board member of ICD, what would you recommend an organization such as ICD do uh, when it comes to issues such as Russia, et cetera? Uh, you know, the one approach would be to say, okay, there's problematic things happening, we don't do anything. Uh, the other approach would be to engage in actually doing things, let's say, in Russia, beyond Russia. It's a challenge, of course, uh, this kind of activity, but what would your advice be, I guess, on the one hand, on the topic of Russia, which you were speaking about, and also in general in terms of human, right, human rights? Where does civil society fit in? You know, what power, what responsibility do we have as citizens? Uh, and where would you like to see more engagement, uh, whether it's ICD or other NGOs, in particular in the regard to, to human rights? Well, on the one hand, of course, I, I'm for um, the idea that we, we have to engage uh, those uh, Russians who care uh, about the human rights, who care the European values, uh, the human values. Uh, but. Um, we must be also realistic that, as I said, I mentioned these history books, for example. This is a very, very difficult task to, to, to get the results. Even, uh, you see, there are many, many young Russian students studying around Europe, across Europe. Maybe they will not go even back to Russia because they, they really don't care and, and or they don't share what, uh, what the Kremlin's agenda is. Uh, but... Uh, Maybe 
Maybe I give you another parallel with, uh, with the case of Belarusia because it's smaller and, and it's uh, easier understandable exactly how much, uh, for example, the, um, uh, like uh, the Western uh, different NGOs uh, and even governments have put uh, resources into the Belarusian opposition and the human rights uh, supporters. And you see the country has been the same. You cannot change even the country of 10 million people. Like, like Belarusia is, if the brainwash is so, so strong, you see, or if the individual sanctions against, against human rights fighters are so, so hard, I mean that if you are risking your own life uh, on a daily basis, if you open your mouth, mouth then um, you simply have a choice, you have a family, you, you cannot do things, I, and I know what I'm talking about, like 10 years ago when I was a... Um, uh, Vice Speaker of the Estonian Parliament, uh, we had the case of 10 uh, young uh, Belarusian students who escaped from Belarus to Estonia. And uh, I worked uh, with two of them very closely together. I know they had a family there back in, in Belarus and, uh, and um, their relatives and so on. And they are still in Estonia. They have been established, uh, the NGOs, they tried to uh, well, attract uh, on ground in Belarus the, the, the institutional relationships uh, with human rights organizations or with people, but they are so weak because they are not allowed to, 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 to work like now Putin has been doing the uh, last uh, two, three years. They are all, uh, I don't know, it's in English, simply they are not closed, but they, 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 they really cannot act. On, on, um, on, on the way uh, what the human rights organizations should do. Uh, if, they if they do open their mouths or they want to do something immediately, they will have taxation department, they will have some sort of harassments, uh, the um, sort of police um, visits to their offices, all the documents are taken, uh, computers are taken. So it's, um, it's, it's a very, very difficult uh, goal. And, and if you train those people outside of uh, Russia or Belarus and they go back, they still cannot change the situation because this has been the experience of last uh, 10, 15 years, what I've seen. I don't want to say that we should stop it, not at all, but I say simply that this is a very, very hard uh, job. I agree, and those are the questions we try to ask also in the framework of the Institute. Uh, as you know, for a long time, cultural diplomacy was really very separate from the field of human rights, but I do think we at least need to study these issues uh, and ideally collaborate at some point as well. But yeah. And, and uh, actually, one more point. <laughs> what the, what the Putin's regime is doing now a couple of years, uh, every summer, they have a summer schools for young people from ex-Soviet Union countries. And uh, for some years, they did not invite anybody from the Baltic states. But now, in, in a few last years, they are inviting especially Russian speakers. You know, we have Russian-speaking people living in, in Baltic states. They invite these uh, school boys and girls uh, to their trainings, and they are military trainings mostly. And, and uh, I've seen the documentary just a couple of weeks ago uh, how um, committed they are playing sort of military games and, and of course for teenagers like uh, 14, 15, 16 years old it's quite uh, on the one hand uh, attractive, funny and then they are brainwashed like we big Russian power, ba, ba, ba. that is, is quite terrifying I mean that and uh, especially young people in this age are they are very you know open of this kind of things to this kind of things. Yes, there is another question. What I realized is that, as with Russia, one of the most, the bigger dangers is that in, in Russia there is a tradition of manipulation. And basically, Putin, that, that's what he's use, doing. He is using a, tra a tradition that was there before, before him, and he's just uh, building on it. And do you think that there are any ways of uh, fighting this phenomenon? 
Well, the other auditorium whom I was talking earlier, I, I think I suggest if you uh, have time and interest, just read about Putin's personality. There are some articles or analyses, and you will find out that he is a very special person and, and he has a very uh, strong uh, feeling uh, to go into the history as a strong man of, of Russia uniting uh, or reuniting, you know, most of the Soviet Union into the Eurasian Union. He wants to be uh, something like Peter the Great or, or Catherine the Great or something like that. These are his favorite books, what he's reading all the time. Uh, and, and this is his mentality. And I think that with this kind of... Um, um, I no, but pro probably he can be called not yet a dictator, but the autocrat, that uh, the danger of this kind of personalities throughout the history to the arrest of, uh, of his, his own people of his country, uh, even his closest uh, comrades, I think, uh, suffer from that, uh, not speaking uh, people like us, that we don't know what's going on on his head, head and what is going to be his next decision. Uh, so it's unpredictable, and I think that this is also a sort of um, dangerous fact, and, and, uh, and this is not only what I've been reading from the analysis, but also talking to Russian opposition leaders, uh, even like uh, Mr. Kasyanov, who has been here addressing the former uh, prime minister of Russia, who was a prime minister in, in Putin's first um, term in, in the government, in 2002-2004, uh, who says that it's very difficult to work with a leader who does not really tell you what he thinks really, what he, what he has in, in his mind. If he doesn't tell that to his closest uh, allies, to his government people, uh, to his party lead people, then it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's dangerous. And then, of course, the KGB, ex-KGB, um, uh, today's FSB, uh, definitely, they, uh, uh, they, they are playing a very big part, very big role in, in this Kremlin's um, uh, management. And even uh, if you, again, if you compare even with the Soviet Union, uh, the KGB in that time was not, uh, it was never controlling the, the, the politics in that time. It was still the Communist Party, which was not the better one, but still Communist Party was uh, separate and the KGB was separate. But now it's all in one. And even if, if Putin leaves, if whatever happens, there will be next man again quite the same, I'm sure, because it, it comes from this uh, KGB, FSB background, because they rule the country. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm, I'm saying so because there is no free elections simply. Uh, only through th free elections, the leaders uh, in democracies can be changed on a on, on, on democratic um, basis. If there is no democratic rules uh, for the elections, uh, then it's clear that uh, you, cannot, you cannot run freely the elections. You cannot win freely the elections. Maybe the revolution will help one day. <laughs> Regar regarding, the, regarding the free elections and uh, the democratic process. I have observed at least, it is my hunch, a personal hunch, that I'm from Romania, and I have observed in my country a complete, a very a remarkable disregard towards the uh, education system. And I think that this is also a, a, a sabotage to democracy, because if you do not educate the people, they will not be able to choose. They will, they will not make an informed decision. And most of the people of my country, when they vote, they do not make an informed decision. Yeah, and this is, uh, again, one element uh, in this um, game is a free media. Again, what is missing in, in Russia? I'm sure there is a free media in, in Romania, but, uh, but in, in Russia, you, you cannot, uh, if you are an opposition uh, party, you, you cannot go to the TV. You are not allowed to go there. You are not allowed to speak. People even don't know that you are existing. Because the mass media, the TV is still in Russia, the major uh, source, uh, the info, in, information source. Not newspapers, uh, well, social media, yes, maybe among young people, uh, but, um, but 
TV channels uh, are the main source, and, and I'm a Russian speaker. I, I, uh, not, this is not my mother tongue, but uh, I can uh, speak freely Russian, and uh, this is um, horrible what they are doing there in their mass media channels. <laughs>